But just to give you an example, Avastin was approved by the FDA in 2004 to treat metastatic colon cancer. They later approved it for breast cancer. It cost over, almost $91,000 a year, which is a lot of money. I mean, the insurance co-pays on some of this stuff cause families to go bankrupt, and that's a consideration as well. But it doesn't extend life for a breast cancer patient by a single day. So again, it goes to the point of it's quite possible to make cancer disappear even, or shrink tumors or disappear and not really have an extended lifespan. And survival outcomes are the thing, are the one thing that we should be looking at. It's really all that matters in the long term. So, um, you know, fear can override uh, traditional, um, can override good decision making, and that often drives people to make wrong decisions. Now, when we start looking at alternative treatments, it, this is equally challenging. The first problem that you have is that there's general hostility from conventional medicine, from academic research centers and government agencies and conventional oncologists. And so one of the first things I'll do when I'm looking into an alternative treatment is I'll go to the government website, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and nine times out of 10, they'll say, this is worthless. We don't want anything to do with it. Nobody should ever use it. It's dangerous and all that sort of thing. And then when I start looking into the actual medical literature, I sometimes find out an entirely different story. Um, part of the problem is from a research standpoint, a lot of these treatments can't be patented, which inhibits research investment. And the gold standard randomized controlled trial is not appropriate for investigating many cancer treatments. Um, and I, I understand that. So what you have is a lot of case reports and testimonials as the only available evidence. Um, and then another issue is that to this, from the standpoint of some of these treatments being represented by some people as being life-saving and by other people as being useless, is goes to something I said earlier, which is the tendency of the cancer patients to become curious when the conventional treatment isn't working. So the cancer has progressed and the treatment has worsened their health. And a treatment like the one we're gonna talk about today may have had a positive effect if it had been instituted earlier and it has less of a chance of having a life-saving effect if it's instituted later when health is considerably worse. And then unfortunately, many treatments, including the one we're gonna talk about today are not available in the United States. So a couple of things that I try to um, turn cancer patients on, all of them uh, when I give lectures or when they come here for assistance. The first thing I think a great book to read is Radical Remission by Kelly Turner. It, um, she also offers an online course. And this book and the course are really about the nine strategies that cancer patients use to survive dire prognoses. I thought the book was fascinating. I think it's not only a great blueprint for cancer patients and their families, it opens up the family's minds to entertaining alternative treatment and that sort of thing. But um, uh, I found it incredibly enlightening in terms of a way to not get cancer. And um, uh, all of these uh, patients did numerous things to save themselves and, and had some very good insights about how they develop cancer, which I think are worth reading about. I also think Jane McClellan's book, How to Starve Cancer, has a very good um, blueprint. It's a bit chaotically written, but I think from the standpoint of helping people to understand what it takes to survive uh, terminal cancer, it's a full-time job. You have to decide that you want to live and then you have to chase after information. And it was not easy, but she had stage four cancer and she was, it's a certain death sentence, what was wrong with her and she's survived and thrived and now helps other cancer patients. And then I already mentioned uh, Ralph Moss, my good friend, who um, I have file drawers full of people here who he saved their lives uh, with by, by basically making available to them and um, making um, information available about uh, cancer treatments we never would have known about. My very first interaction with Dr. Moss was with a um, my landlord's, then landlord's wife who had a malignant neck tumor, which is almost always a death sentence. And um, we found out that there was a treatment in Germany that worked very well for her type of cancer. Almost everybody survived. Somebody in California was offering it. And uh, we still get together um, uh, routinely to talk about um, uh, uh, on the anniversary of her um, um, uh, survival uh, and, uh, and celebrate the fact that here it is 21 years later and she's still alive. So um, one last thing, the National Cancer Institute has a PDQ database, the Physician's Data Query. Um, look at the health professional version. There's more information. It gives you a pretty good idea of what the government says about cancer treatments. And one thing I'll tell you that surprised me about this is um, 
is that um, sometimes the one government site will say this is a terrible idea. And then you go to this health professional PDQ database and it actually says that the government is, is doing a clinical trial, which indicates they're giving more credence to it than they're letting the public know about. So I recommend that as a resource as well. So believe it or not, and this is a shock to me as much as it might be to you, but I, I wanted to do um, a deep dive into a cancer therapy because I could just tell you an overview of 10 of them and it wouldn't really tell you very much. But the reason I chose this one, uh, there are several reasons actually, is that there's a lot to say about it, number one. Number two, when I started looking into hoxy therapy, um, I thought I was beyond bias. I like to think I'm beyond bias. I'm open-minded to looking at things and I start with a clean slate just to see what's there. But I had heard so much bad stuff about Hoxie that I figured, well, there might be something to it. Probably there's nothing to it, but I'll start looking into it. And you know, I'll probably come to the conclusion that it might be somewhat worthwhile for some people, but certainly not worth investing a lot of time and energy in. And what I uncovered when I started looking into it was enough to fill two lectures. And not only is there something to this, it is probably the worst case of all that I've looked at of government and organized medicine railroading something that could probably save, could have saved uh, millions of lives if used historically. And um, it is not available in the United States and, and uh, uh, could save millions of lives if available here. And I will tell you at the conclusion of all this, uh, you, you'll just have to see what happens here as I am, you know, give you all this information. But at the conclusion, I started out with an open mind, but kind of slanted toward it was quackery. And at the end decided that if I had certain types of cancer, I would go to Mexico and I would get this treatment. So I have a lot of slides here and mainly because I think that it's important to understand the breadth of the campaign against HOXI, against the enormous amount of evidence in favor of HOXI. In other words, if I just said, look, they chased him around a lot and a lot of doctors thought he was right, it doesn't really tell you the story of what happened here, which is really worth looking at. So I'll go through this pretty quickly.